instructors class. So that means you are a guy, you guys pretty well know basic techniques of what's happening. So my job today is I don't want you necessarily to necessarily complete the project. I want you to know how you completed the project. Does that make sense? Because if you know how to complete a project, you know how to help students complete their project when they get problems. Anybody can complete a project, but it's the guy that go in there and say, stop, you're going the wrong way, or you need to fix this right now, do this a little bit different so you don't screw it up. That's the guy that knows what's going on. See what I mean? So the idea of this project here, the basic techniques, is to be able to complete the project. But the idea is not to complete the project, it's to know how you complete the project, okay? And do it in a very, a very efficient way. A man is his own teacher. A teacher only saves some time. You can imagine it, you can find a way to do it eventually if you work at it hard enough or persevere at it. Anvil height. All the books you see talk about that's the height of an anvil, correct? Where were the books written? 1800s. You guys were five foot tall. Okay. There's only five basic hammer marks a hammer could ever make. Flat, left, right, toe, and heel. That's it. It's the only march you can make of a hammer. Go off from the left to the toe, right to the heel, whatever you want to do. Only five basic hammer marks. What hammer mark do we use 90% of the time? Flat. Basically flat hammer marks. Okay? When my hammer handle is parallel with the ground, the face is parallel with the handle, I have a flat hammer mark. When I drop it like this, I make a toe mark or a forward mark. Do you, you understand that concept? So, if my anvil is too low, I'll be constantly making a toe mark. That means I got to bend over to get a flat mark. As soon as I bend over, I'm no longer swinging a hammer. I'm pushing a hammer. Pushing a hammer uses different muscles, works your back differently. So when you're pushing, that's different than swinging. Okay? So for me, the height of a forging anvil for me is the height of when my hammer handle comes parallel to the ground minus the size of stock I'm going to use. So I'm going to use three-quarter inch stock, so I can put this right here. That would be the height of the anvil for me. Whether it's this hammer or this hammer, and I'm flat. If it's here, it's going to be knocking the punch out. If it's here, it's going to be knocking the punch out. So I take this here, put the average striking tool underneath of it, put the work down here, figure that out. That's the height of the striking it. Because the books are written for strikers. Not for four inches. So this anvil there would be a perfect height for me for someone with a top tool to strike it. But it'd be bad for a forging anvil for me. So I'm gonna be bent over, my bass will be tight, the next one gets sore, and it'll be irritable. And like Frank Turner says, if you're gonna be irritable, you're gonna do irritable work. The terminology down here so we understand what my notes say. When you forge out a piece of metal and you make a taper, you see where the taper starts? Taper ends. That's a short, flat taper. If you cannot tell where the taper starts or taper ends, it's a long, flat taper. Even if it's this on the side, be a flat taper. See what I mean? So that that'd be a flat taper. If this were square, this would be a square taper. So this would be a short square taper. If it was a long square taper, you couldn't tell where it started or it ended. I'm sorry, it's round, square, or flat. Short taper, you know where it starts. Long taper, you don't know where it starts. It just kind of flows back in. Okay? Uh, what shape is this mountain? Okay, if this is a round shape, what's its form? Cylinder. If this is a round shape, what form is it? You know, it's a cylinder. To me, this is a straight shape and a round form. A curved shape, a round form. Straight shape, a flat form. Does that make sense?
sense? So when we're blacksmiths, we forge the form and we forge the shape. Okay? I found space since you guys are students, you guys are teaching students. For me to make a scroll, I have to forge a short, flat, tapered form into a long, flat, tapered form before I can take that form change the shape into a scroll shape. But the form is still a long flat taper. So when I forge, I try to force the form and then change the shape. How will you know the difference? Air to metal, shape. Metal to metal, form. If I'm forming a scroll, I'm shape, shape, form, shape, form. One's plump, one's a ring. That procedure I just did right there on a scroll would wind up the scroll would, would, would look like this. Form, shape, form, shape. That's what I just did. Four different ones. That will change the form, that was the shape. Your job as a teacher is to teach them efficiency and how to make less mistakes and get the job, get the job done quicker and still learn the techniques. So not make it hard for them, make it easier for them. Okay? So my question is, is, since you guys have been forging for a while, I'm gonna take a piece of quarter inch a piece of one quarter inch this round stuff. How many hammer hits is it going to take me to make a tapered round, a tapered long, a short tapered round point on the end of this? Does anybody know? Four tapered Four. Four hits, okay. Myself, I can't get it done in 50, I'm not efficient. So if I get it done, Bo Hickey says, if I can make a candlestick in 100 hits and you make it 500 hits, I'm going to make more money than you because I'm more efficient than you. The idea is to become very efficient. So if I took this quarter inch round stock out of here, or not. You're just putting time in. So the idea is, and I hope that most people who want to teach blacksmithing want to teach a technique efficiently. Why would people want to learn blacksmithing? Sure, people like Sam Goodwin, they're just advocational. They just want to learn it. They're never going to use it. But I'll bet you, 90 of the people who want to learn blacksmithing want to learn it so they can do something using old skills to sell it to make money. Would you guys agree upon that? I want to sell those things on eBay or, or uh, the internet and make money at it. So someday I become a blacksmith and quit my bank job. I'll bet you most of them are thinking that in their mind when they take a blacksmith class. Very few of them are thinking, I just want to learn it just to learn it for the heck of it. I'll bet you most of them want to make some money at it somehow. So therefore, the more efficient they are, the more money they make. So now I'm going to take some 3 8 inch round stuff. Once you get blacksmithing, once you take 
the square point. Round stop, turn into square. You got four sides. You knock off four sides, you have eight. You take those eight facets, knock those off, you now have 16. 16 sides in metal appears round. That's all I have, 16 sides right here. That, for all practical purposes, is smithing. I got a quarter-inch round stop. I did 50 hits, approximately. How can I become more efficient? Maybe hit a little harder? Maybe hit a little bit differently? I don't know. So I'm going to take that round stop, maybe a little harder.